Hello class, today we're going to talk about chapter four, nonverbal communication. And as you recall, um, there are six barriers to intercultural communication and nonverbal miscommunications are one of the barriers to intercultural communication. So we're gonna talk about some functions of nonverbal communication and then we're gonna talk about the different names that we have for all of our nonverbal functions. We are going to discuss how these nonverbals differ from culture to culture. So let's jump right into it. Um, this is a little bit longer of a lecture, so if you need to pause to take notes or pause to take a break, please do so. Okay, the definition of nonverbal communication is the process of intentionally, so meaning you mean to do something, or unintentionally, signaling meaning through behavior other than words. So language is written words, uh, spoken word, and everything else is nonverbal communication. So nonverbal communication accounts for a huge percentage of our communication, somewhere between 65 and 95% of communication is actually nonverbal. So an example of this would be if we look at this picture. So the woman in this picture is smiling. So she's giving us some facial gestures there. Um, we can also see that she's moving her hands and signaling some sort of hand gesture. We can look at her clothing, her hairstyle, her artifacts such as earrings, and all of these are signaling meaning. If we looked at this picture, we might guess that this person is maybe performing a dance um, it's probably a cultural dance based on what she's wearing, and she looks pretty friendly because we see a smile on her face. So these are examples of nonverbal communication. Anything that is not language, that is not words, is considered nonverbal. So nonverbal communication differs depending on if you are from a low context or high context culture. So remember, low context cultures such as um, Scandinavian cultures, the United States, Australia, Germany, these are low context cultures, which means they rely less on the context to communicate and more on language. So usually communication is very direct and we don't look too much at nonverbals. Then we go to high context cultures. So South American cultures, um, African cultures, Southern European groups, um, and then Eastern cultures. Um, these cultures rely more on the context for meaning. So we're gonna look at things like nonverbal communication, um, the environment or setting, uh, who is the elder in the family, who is the person who is of a higher rank, all of those things come into play in these high context cultures. Whereas in low context cultures, the message is going to be more explicit. So that's how nonverbals sort of vary. So if you're guessing which group nonverbals matter more to, it's going to be the high context groups that rely more on nonverbal communication. So there are six functions of nonverbal communication, and here they are. We're going to get into each one of these, and I'll describe all of these functions for you. So let's jump right into the first function of nonverbal communication. Uh, we use nonverbals to actually replace spoken messages. So we can provide a substitute for a verbal message through things like symbols. Uh, for example, the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of freedom. Um, it's also sort of a welcome symbol. It was placed next to Ellis Island off the coast of New York um, as sort of a symbol that um, is like a guiding light for people coming to the United States. Um, there are words inscribed at the bottom as well. Um, another example would be the American flag. Um, can replace a spoken message. It represents um, our country. It represents freedom, for example. Uh, gestures can also replace spoken messages. So something as simple as a wave or an OK sign could have, have meaning. Facial expressions, we're going to get more into this later, um, but there are certain facial expressions that are universally recognizable um, and then certain ones that aren't. So for example, a smile usually means joy or happiness or that you like something. 
So here are some other examples of symbols. Um, each area, each country, each culture has symbols that are unique and that hold meaning specific to that group. So this one would probably make you think of San Francisco because it's a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, this is a religious symbol of Islam. Here we have a sports symbol for the Patriots. And this is the yin and yang symbol, which um, is an Eastern Asian symbol representing harmony. So the next one is nonverbals can replace spoken messages. Um, and it's important to recognize that these symbols are culturally relative. So something like the bald eagle represents the United States, uh, but this isn't going to be the case for every group. So for example, Brazil's national animal <clears throat> um, is the leopard. And, um, excuse me, not the leopard, the jaguar. And um, this animal was actually brought to their opening ceremonies during the Olympics that were held in Brazil. Um, and so that's a good example of a symbol or something that is representative of a specific cultural group. All right, so facial expressions. Researchers have found evidence for seven universal facial expressions. So what does this mean? It means that these seven expressions are pretty recognizable around the world. So here we go. Um, happiness and surprise. I put stars next to these two, and you should know this for maybe a quiz question. These two facial expressions are the most recognizable. So if someone is smiling or laughing, for example, we can pretty much understand what that means, no matter which culture we're from. Um, of course, some of these facial expressions, like a smile, could mean other things in other cultures, uh, but for the most part, these are pretty recognizable. Um, so the rest of them are sadness, anger, disgust, fear, and then contempt was added on in recent years. So um, you should know all of these seven universal expressions, but definitely know which two are the most recognizable, happiness and surprise. I thought this was interesting. Um, during the Winter Olympics, uh, there was an article that found figure skating actually rates the skaters on their facial expressions and ability to tell a story with their body language and facial expressions. So they are actually scored on their facial expressions and nonverbal communication. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and as we can see here, the skaters are showing like joy on their faces as they do this ice dance. All right, so the second one is sending uncomfortable messages. So sometimes we are a little anxious and we might not want to explicitly say what we are feeling because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings or embarrass someone else um, or embarrass ourselves. And so we might use our nonverbal communication to signal meaning, to signal things like, I'm uncomfortable, I need to go, I love you. One of my favorite television shows is The Bachelor. And as we can see on this show, um, there's one bachelor and 30 women who he's dating. And oftentimes, women might say, I love you. But it's not really appropriate for The Bachelor to say, I love you, to every person. So he might show that with his nonverbal communication. As we can see in this picture here, all nonverbal gestures and facial expressions point to, I care about you, I'm interested in you, I love you. You can also th signal things like, Ooh, I don't like that, or I'm uncomfortable with your body language and facial expressions. Um, here's a pretty powerful nonverbal message. Um, we see Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during the national anthem at football games. Um, this is to signal protest. And I did put a podcast on this week's module. Um, it's not required reading, but if you are interested in learning more about why Kaepernick chose to take a knee, I did post that up for you this week if you want to take a listen. Okay, so the third function of nonverbals is to form impressions that guide communication. So we want to steer communication, and we can do this in several ways. 
Um, so we can say, I like what you're saying. Keep talking to me through facial expressions or touch. Uh, maybe you're smiling or making eye contact with somebody or you give them a touch on the arm or the shoulder. Um, we can also guide communication through things like artifacts, like how you're dressed, um, grooming, how you cut your hair, whether or not you showered that day. If you want to show up to a job interview and make a good impression, um, it is expected that you dress a certain way and that you come well-groomed to that interview. Um, so I just wanted to show you some pictures of three different women here. And usually in a classroom setting, I might ask students, you know, what do you think about each person? What is your first impression? Uh, because nonverbal communication really does offer up that first impression. And some students will say, well, I really don't know them. I don't, I can't say anything about them. Um, other people will say, well, okay, the person on the left has tattoos and she's smiling and you know, she's dressed pretty casual, so I'm going to guess she's friendly. Maybe she's a bartender. Uh, sometimes students say the person in the middle looks like, you know, she works at a business and she's really serious. Uh, and then the person on the right, I get a lot of students who say, this person is clearly crazy. She's wearing a lot of color and tie-dye and, you know, look at her eye makeup. Um, and so the point here is that these nonverbals do give off impressions and they guide communication. So based on artifacts that you're wearing, um, things like that, even your facial expression can really signal to somebody, um, you know, hi, I want to talk to you or, you know, I'm more serious or something like that. And so it's important to consider these things depending on the context and what situation you're in, you know, what type of impression do you want to give off? So I thought this was interesting. In 2018, Donald Trump um, met Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. And an article came out the next day that said the two shared a historic 13-second handshake. I don't know if you ever shake somebody's hand, but it usually doesn't last for 13 seconds. And that's why it made the news. Um, the article also pointed out that Kim Jong-un was kind of smiling a little bit, whereas President Trump had a more like scowl, serious look on his face. Um, and they did come out with a transcript of what the two said to each other. And Kim Jong-un, who is a little bit shorter, you can see, said, nice to meet you. And President Trump said, um, we will have a terrific relationship together, no doubt. And so after some analysis of the nonverbals, um, people sort of came to the conclusion that maybe they shook hands for a long time because this was such a historical meeting. Uh, maybe they were trying to show dominance over each other. Uh, we weren't really quite sure, but that's sort of what people thought. All right, so artifacts can also communicate meaning. So what is an artifact? An artifact is an object. Um, so it could be things like your clothing, um, jewelry, for example, the way that you choose to decorate your house or even decorate your body. So one such example is tattoos. So in the Polynesian cultures, it is believed that a person's mana or their spiritual power or life force is displayed through tattooing. So tattoos are placed around the body during specific events in that person's life um, and where they are placed and what they have um, holds specific meaning and also tells a story. So tattooing is a large part of traditional Polynesian culture. Okay, so I thought this was an interesting way um, to express nonverbal communication at a funeral. So when you think of proper attire, um, facial expressions at an American funeral, it's pretty somber, it's pretty serious. People are usually wearing dark colors like black, um, but this isn't the case for every culture. So in Ghanaian funerals, they are considered a celebration of life. In these events, we see music, food, formal attire, and bright colors. So bright colors like red, green, yellow, um, and here we see a young boy sort of dancing at a Ghanaian funeral, and we can see that he's wearing a bright colored shirt, and there's also a drum next to him which has bright colors. 
So I thought this was interesting. Hindu brides were asked to wear which color during wedding proceedings because it stands for prosperity and fertility. If you guessed red, you'd be correct. So as we can see, different norms for different cultures. Um, in contrast, at a Hindu funeral, what color is vital to the culture, symbolizing purity and respect? So if you were to guess white, you'd be correct. So as you see in this photograph here, uh, white is the color that is typically worn at this type of funeral. All right, so the fourth function of nonverbal communication is nonverbal communication can make relationships clear. So for example, at work or school, you might wanna take a look at seating arrangements. This could tell you who is in power in that area. Um, for example, a boss might have a larger office, boss or supervisor. Um, a teacher might have more space in the classroom, whereas all the rest of the chairs are smaller and sort of facing one direction in the front. Uh, teachers usually have a podium. They might also have a smart classroom with a computer. They might have a whiteboard. Um, so if you were to walk into a room, you might be able to tell who is the person in power in that room. Um, think about your home. Who has the largest room in your house? Uh, when I was growing up, my parents had the master bedroom. You know, they had a walk-in closet and a bathroom and like tub in their bedroom. And my brother and I had smaller bedrooms. Uh, typically, those in power and authority use more space and take up more space. So that's why the supervisor, the owner of the company, will have the largest office. They might have a window, whereas the rest of us might have cubicles. So this would be the person with the big office, the person who sits at the head of the table. Think about this in your family relationships and in your working relationships. And those in power tend to usually sit in a more comfortable position. I thought this was interesting. So they might relax more, lean back more. This made me think of a job interview that I was in. You know, I was sitting on a sofa. I was sitting upright, you know, as upright as I could. Um, and the person interviewing me was kind of leaning back in a more comfortable chair that swiveled a little bit. And so they were sitting in this more relaxed position. Um, they might also have more relaxed body posture and more casual body language. Uh, I'm going to tell you a brief story. So this is a picture that represents me when I was sick at work. I wasn't feeling good and my supervisor came in. and I had a pretty close relationship with her and I said, you know, I'm not really feeling great. And she actually took her hand and she put it on my stomach and I was kind of shocked. And uh, I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, you know, when my kids are sick, I put my hand on their tummies. And if their tummies are hot, then I know they have a fever. <laughs> and I thought about this for a second. You know, I was okay with her doing this. I was, I was pretty close with her, even though it was unexpected. Um, I thought, wow, that's super inappropriate because I don't think that any of the employees could go up to our supervisor and do that to her. Uh, but she was in this sort of position of power, and so I kind of let it slide, so to speak, um, because she was my boss. So that's one such example of how relationships can be shown through our nonverbal communication. All right, so relationships, um, nonverbal communication is linked to power distance. And as we read in the last chapter, power distance is how a culture accepts um, and expects power disparities. So how we come to accept people in power, systems of power, and authority. And we can see this in our nonverbal communication. So um, we might make more eye contact with somebody who is our supervisor. Um, in Eastern cultures, eye contact can be seen as aggressive. And so it's a sign of respect to not make eye contact. So in China, for example, um, for your supervisor, you would not make eye contact with them as a sign of respect. And this is an example of how we would display power distance in our nonverbal communication. So I just want to uh, reiterate here that in high power distance cultures, these are going to be like Eastern cultures like China, and low power distance cultures are Western cultures like the United States 
both cultures display nonverbal behaviors that reinforce power distance. So I'm going to give you another example. Um, Tilburg University of the Netherlands did a study on nonverbal communication and how it correlates with power distance. So they studied Chinese and Dutch students and they told the students, we're going to introduce you to a quote professor. And what do you think their nonverbal responses were? Uh, one is a high context culture, one is a low context culture. So the Chinese students, high context culture, avoided eye contact with the quote professors. So as a sign of respect, they did not make eye contact. Whereas the Dutch students, as a sign of respect, did make more eye contact because they are a low context culture. Uh, so this is just an interesting study of the difference between how these two different groups um, show respect for power. All right, so the fifth function is we use nonverbals to regulate interaction. Um, and the final one is reinforce and modify verbal messages. So uh, let's go over number five here, regulating interaction. Um, we regulate interaction uh, through our facial expressions, gestures, and body language. So we can signal, I'm interested, keep talking to me, or we can signal like, I need to go, or I don't wanna be in this conversation, or I'm uncomfortable. You might look at your watch, you might break eye contact, for example. You might even turn your body a little bit. Um, to show, like, you know, I really don't want to participate in this conversation anymore. And the last one is reinforcing and modifying verbal messages. So sometimes our nonverbals accompany a verbal message. So, for example, maybe this guy um, is out shopping with his girlfriend and she's like, hey, do you like this new blouse? I think I'm going to buy it. And he says, yeah, I like it but he's scratching his head and sort of making this confused face. Um, so we can see that his nonverbal message is actually contradicting his verbal message. And so we're probably gonna rely on that nonverbal message a little bit more. Um, maybe he says, yes, I love it, with a smile on his face, I love your blouse. Then that would reinforce our verbal message and you know, confirm, yes, okay, he does like this new shirt. All right, so we're gonna go over each of these. These are names for those functions, and we call these nonverbal message codes. So proxemics, or uh, the way we use space, um, or proximity to another person. Kinesics is body language. Think of kinesiology. Oculesics is eye behavior. Haptics is touch. Chronemics is the way we use time. Paralanguage are little sort of noises and inflections in our tone of voice. So, yes, I love that top, or oh, yeah, I like it, um, would signal meaning. Silence. So, in different cultures, silence is sometimes valued, um, and in other cultures, not. Territoriality or um, how we view our territory, the things that we own. Uh, we talked about power distance, who gets the big office, for example. And then the final one is olfactics or smell. So I'm gonna give you some examples of each of these. Okay, proxemics is the study of personal space. Um, and if you had to guess in the United States, you might guess that we like personal space space. We oftentimes will say things like, this is my personal bubble, do not come into my personal bubble without permission. And in other cultures, there's no such thing as personal space, or personal space might be different. Um, for example, when we're talking to somebody, we usually will stand at a social distance, so somewhere between 4 feet and 12 feet, which seems really far, but if you were to actually measure, you probably do have most of your conversations 4 feet away from somebody. And we only allow very select people into our personal and intimate space. And oftentimes, if somebody's talking too close to you, you might back up a little and say, you know, hey, or not even say anything, you might just take a step back. Um, if they're talking too close to you. Uh, whereas in other cultures, um, touching a total stranger might be normal. Um, in Japan, for example, there are a lot of people, millions of people in a very small area. So when you get on the train, uh, when you are standing in line somewhere, you might physically be touching somebody that you don't even know. 
Um, I often ask students, how do you feel when you go to a grocery store and somebody you don't know behind you kind of bumps you in line? You feel angry. You know, you feel like, who is this person who is touching me? Um, and so that is how we know how we use our personal space. So self and intimate space um, is zero, zero to 18 inches and 18 inches to four feet. Then we have this social space where we feel pretty comfortable talking to people. Um, and then 12 feet and beyond is considered public space. We feel very comfortable in this space um, with strangers, for example, like if you're at a park or something like that. So um, proxemics is the way we use and communicate with space. Um, we might come into someone's personal space to show that we like them or that we're interested in them. You might touch somebody on the arm or hold their hand, for example. Uh, friends might hug. And of course, proxemics is highly, highly dependent on culture. Um, in some cultures, when they greet, they hug and kiss on both cheeks. Uh, in the United States, we typically shake hands. Um, obviously now with everything going on with the coronavirus, nobody is shaking hands and we are told to socially distance from people. And so we pretty much stay six feet away from people and kind of just wave now instead of introducing ourselves. Okay, so kinesics are any sort of body movement, gestures, facial expressions, um, and can even include eye contact. Um, so the way that we wave to somebody, uh, what our facial expressions are saying to people, um, if you roll your eyes at somebody might be disrespectful, all of these are considered kinesics. All right, oculusics specifically is just eye contact. And if you hadn't guessed, eye contact is very important in Western cultures. So the United States is a Western culture. We value eye contact. To show respect, you make eye contact with somebody. If you're in a job interview, you make eye contact. To show you're listening or that you care, you make eye contact. Whereas in Eastern cultures, um, it can be seen as disrespectful or aggressive if you make too much eye contact with somebody. Um, in the United States, eye contact is often gauged to show that you're being truthful. So you might look somebody in the eye, you know, and really show that you are telling the truth. Um, and then finally, eye contact is used to create immediacy. Um, this is only for Western cultures, not for Eastern cultures. So immediacy means a feeling of closeness. So you can show that you really care about somebody or that you are interested in them by making eye contact. Not too much because you don't want to be creepy and you don't want to freak somebody out, um, but showing a regular amount of eye contact um, will create that feeling of immediacy. Um, in fact, there was a study done with physicians and patients, and um, the patients reported that they trusted their doctors more, and they perceived greater health outcomes from doctors that made more eye contact with them. So I thought that was super interesting. I thought back on all the times I went to the doctor's office, and you know, the doctor didn't really make too much eye contact with me and just kind of had their sheet in front of them and said, how are you feeling today? Here's a prescription versus other doctors that would look me in the eye and really ask me what my symptoms were and take the time to talk to me and actually felt like they were listening. So that feeling of immediacy was greater with those doctors that made eye contact. Okay, so haptics is touch. Got a few pictures here. So touch can signal meaning. As we see, there are some uh, friends down here hugging, maybe saying, hi, oh, good to see you. You know, it's been a long summer. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Michelle and Barack Obama. They are fist bumping. Um, this was after a speech that, you know, Barack gave. And so I think they're signaling to each other, like, way to go, good job. So we can use touch to communicate. Um, and I did find a study on rates of touch in different countries. So which country do you think has the highest rate of casual touch? That means like during a conversation, um, you know, touching somebody in a casual way. So the answer is France. And ironically, the United States uh, was seen as touch deprived, having one of the lowest rates of casual touch in the world. So Okay, so the next one is chronemics, and this is how we see and use time. So there are two different ways that we view time. So monochronic is viewing time as linear or moving forward. So the United States views time as a monochronic linear way. Um, we 
carefully plan out our day. We see time as an asset. We think being on time or punctuality is really important. We might schedule out a meeting from, for just one hour. You know, we need to accomplish all of these things in the one hour. Uh, we schedule out our entire day and we see being on time as respectful. So time is of utmost importance in the United States. Uh, the second view of time is a polychronic view of time. So this is seeing time as cyclical, ever-present, or sort of just being around a individual or group of people. So in this view of time, time exists, but the time guidelines are less stringent. So this view of time stresses involvement of people rather than adherence to strict schedules. So in these types of cultures, um, the meetings are less stringent. You might just stay in the meeting until the task is finished. Um, dinners might last longer than in the United States. So Latin America, Middle Eastern cultures, and East Asian cultures are polychronic. You might hear the phrase island time. Um, for example, I went to Hawaii, which is heavily influenced by Polynesian culture, and you know we signed up for scuba diving. And my family showed up at 8 a.m. for scuba diving, ready to go. And our tour guide said, you know, well, we have a lot of other groups coming, and we're just going to wait as long as it takes for everyone to get here. And we thought that was kind of disrespectful. Um, and we ended up leaving about 8:30, which wasn't too bad, uh, but. This is an example of a more cyclical, more polychronic view of time. There is one factor we all share and have equal access to, time. No matter who we are, each day we are presented with 86,400 seconds to use, lose, spend, or save. Not everyone or every culture views or values time the same way. Depending on where you live in the world, you have developed your view of time and what it means to how you conduct your day. One aspect of time that differs among cultures is chronemics, and that is the study of the role of time in communication. Time is money is a key saying in cultures that see time as linear and measured by tangible results. We call these cultures monochronic. In monochronic cultures, you learn sayings like, a stitch in time saves nine, or time flies. Monochronic cultures see time as linear, agendas specify how time is used, and the expectation is that certain things will be accomplished within a given time frame. Monochronic cultures set their watches and clocks, and time becomes the designated driver of what happens in the course of a day. In contrast are cultures that may adhere to being more on island time. Polychronic cultures view time not as fixed, but as flexible. What happens in the course of a day is not measured on a to-do list, but more on a what-did-you-get-to-do list. Relationships are as important as tasks in most polychronic cultures. Lunch can run long if we are talking and discussing, well into a monochronic workday. Many things might happen in a meeting that do not relate to a proposed topic. Time is fluid and driven, not by the exact minute, but what is present in the moment. Most of the business world has adopted a monochronic time concept. Emails, project completion, and deadlines demand that we adhere to linear schedules, but much can be learned from stepping back when possible and allowing ourselves to experience time and relationship in a polychronic way. Edward T. Hall, the famous scientist who studied culture said, two points that are very important points to remember and ask. Is it real and does it work? Both monochronic time and polychronic time are real, and they both work just differently, garnering different results and varied experiences. Okay, so I thought that was a nice brief video explaining the difference between monochronic and polychronic time. 
Uh, this, you will not be tested on this material, but I thought it was interesting. There was a case study done on time and sleep. And so this study uh, surveyed 10,000 people. It was conducted by the University of Michigan and concluded that a culture's relation to time correlates with their sleep patterns. So as you might guess, in a monochronic culture like the United States, we might have bed times or we might have times that we have to get up early in the morning um, because of our schedule. And so here are some of the uh, countries that participated. There were 20 different countries and there were Eastern and Western cultures here. So I thought it was a good representation of different countries around the world. And just for fun, here are some of the findings. So the first finding was that gender influences sleep patterns. And the study found that women and girls were sleeping more. Um, this was because many women and girls spent more time at home. Uh, women were, their primary role globally was taking care of children. And so they might be able to sleep when the children are sleeping or they might go to bed earlier. The next finding was geographic location and daylight affected sleep time. So as you could guess, if it is lighter longer, you might stay awake longer. Um, Spain and Singapore went to bed the latest. So a lot of times a happy hour or dinner will start at 9 or 10 in the evening and uh, or even like drinks like uh, for work with coworkers or business dealings might happen after work. And so these are sort of reasons why these cultures might go to bed later. The United States went to bed earliest and woke up earliest. Japan was late to bed, early to rise, and the study found this was in line with their work ethic. So Japan has a very strict work ethic, and many people work long hours. So after work, they might go out um, and talk with more clients, or they might work some more. And then polychronic cultures went to bed later, and monochronic cultures went to bed earlier, adhering to those more strict time schedules. So if you want to check out uh, which country you sleep like, you can go to time.com um, and here's the web address. And so I put in what time I went to bed. I typically go to bed around 11.30 and I like to wake up at 7 or 8 in the morning. And so um, the study found that I sleep like a Mexican woman. So this was kind of fun if you want to check this out. Okay, more nonverbal codes, paralanguage. Paralanguage are those little vocal characterizers that aren't quite words, but that still signal meaning. So things like laughs, sobs, or crying. Um, the way that you change your pitch, tone, and intensity. So we call these vocal qualifiers. So if we say, yes, I would like to do that, or yes, I'll do that. Um, that would also signal meaning. Um, and then vocal segregators, so things like um and uh can signal nervousness or that you're confused. Um, and I thought this was interesting that ps um, in Spain calls over a waiter and is not really seen as disrespectful. And that ps in India is seen as disrespectful. I was thinking about whether or not this would go over well in a restaurant here, and I probably think the waiter might be offended if you psst at them. Um, tone is important in different cultures, so a soft tone in Thailand is seen as respectful. And in Western cultures, um, we value... Um, language and speech and so people are encouraged to speak up more and raise their voice in Western cultures. And a laugh in Asian cultures can often be a sign of discomfort. So just some uh, interesting facts about nonverbal paralanguage around the world. Okay, so silence is also really important when it comes to nonverbal message codes and can communicate a number of meanings. So traditionally, in Eastern societies, silence is valued more than in Western cultures. So silence can signal things like harmony and respect for an entire group. 
So students might often save their questions until the end of class to ask their teacher because they don't want to disrupt the group. Um, and Asian cultures associate silence with wisdom and it is often used to express power. Uh, this might be why monks take a vow of silence. So which country does not like excuses and values a response in two words or less? Swaziland, Thailand, Japan, or Brazil? If you guessed Japan, you'd be correct. So Japan values short and quick responses. Okay, so the next nonverbal code is territoriality or how we organize space and communicate messages. So, for example, feng shui is the Chinese art of manipulating the physical environment to establish harmony within the room. So think about in your own home how you chose to arrange furniture. Uh, where do conversations happen? In my house, most conversation happens in the kitchen. That's where we're cooking dinner. That's where we um, gather every evening. And so uh, that space is primarily where we interact and communicate with each other. The next one is olfactics or smell. So communicating via smell. This is really interesting. Sense is the only nonverbal code linked directly to our limbic system, signaling emotions and feelings. So sometimes you can smell something and it will trigger an emotion and a feeling. When I smell like a pumpkin spice candle, I can't help but think of fall and um, Halloween and Thanksgiving and all of the holidays that go along with that. It gives me this feeling of comfort. So sort of think back on maybe a smell that evokes an emotion or feeling for you. And I thought this was really interesting. Cross-culturally, so across cultures, women can detect odor in a lower concentration and identify more accurately and remember the smell longer. Fun fact. Okay, so we have reached the end of our PowerPoint. Um, it is important for you to know the six functions or reasons why we use nonverbal communication, and then also to know the names of all of the nonverbal codes. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And that was our lesson on nonverbal communication.